All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, you're all looking lovely, as usual. Good to see some lovely faces. A um, couple of notices. Do pray for Joan, please. Her mother's very ill and she's got carers and she's had to go up and see her again today. Um, she's been away a lot in midweek, but um, I think her mother's hospital appointment tomorrow, uh, something like that, and again, next Sunday she probably won't be there. So pray for Joan and her mother and her family. Pray for Sue Bayless. The last I heard, she was in hospital having an emergency operation for a block colon, I believe it was. Anybody got up to date information on how it went? I think um, Katie said that John had been able to visit her and she was sitting up in bed looking cheerful. Oh, good. That's good. That's great. That's lovely. Okay. I don't. I can't hear can you repeat what I just said? Um, she said that um, she heard from Katie, who said that John had been able to go into hospital to see Sue, and Sue was sitting up in bed, smiling. You know, that's Sue, though, isn't it? Uh, there we are, that's good. That's good. Um, Wednesday, there's this service for unity in St. Stephen's at, what time is it? 7.30. 7.30. There are still some spare spaces if you wish to come, uh, but you need to phone Joe, I think, to book a place. Okay, so if you want to come, the church is in Pangborn and Pearly, and us uh, get together well, once a year for this service, but get together for other months. <coughs> Any other notices, anyone, please? Okay, well, tomorrow we can have six people in our house. Who wants to come for coffee? <laughs> <laughs> there, there we go, yes. Things begin to eat, so that's absolutely wonderful, isn't it? But here we are. Anyway, you've got the service sheet there in front of you. If you'd like to follow it with me, you can, please. This is the collect for today. O oh God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. We beseech you, leave us not comfortless, but send your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to the place where your, our Saviour Christ has gone before, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A wonderful calling which exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to have a hymn now which exalts the Lord Jesus Christ, crowning him with many crowns, crowning with crowning the Son of God, crowning the Lord of life, crowning the Lord of heaven, and some say crowning the Lord of love. So if you'd like to sing, you have to sit in the front row. Thank you. Thank you. 
In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled, in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. Therefore, it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, 
and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. And then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, and so he was added to the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. This is not a sermon, this is just a comment or two. Did you notice in there, it said, um, it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time that Jesus was living among us. So this films we get of Jesus and 12 men going around the place, and the, you know, the classic paintings of Jesus and 12, probably not correct. These two, so it makes it up to 14, it also tells us that some of the women went around with him, uh, to help him. So, you know, there was obviously more than just the twelve. And uh, so, you know, think about that. When you when you see these films with just the twelve, there were others there. There were others there. And um, Christ, there was probably um, many others on certain occasions. The other thing to notice about this <clears throat> is that they have to be have been there at John's baptism. When John baptized Jesus Christ. Hmm, that's interesting. Now we know that Andrew, I think, is one of John's disciples, so he probably would have been there when Jesus was baptized and saw the Spirit coming down upon them. But I'm left with the question um, were all the twelve there? I don't know. Think about it. We're going to prepare ourselves for prayer and with a lovely hymn. Father, hear the prayer we offer, and then Clyde is going to lead us in our prayers, please. Council AGM in 1961. Mr. Cumber, Cumber, Field, the butchers, farmers, chairman of finance. And I always remember this. He said, The next item on the capital program is the purchase of a computer. I don't know what a computer is, but the treasurer says we've got to have one. I move. And they voted to spend £250,000. 1961, it's two, two and a half million today. And they bought something, didn't even know what it was. At the end of the, they were going to have a first zebra crossing information item. Everybody in the council got up <coughs> to speak about road safety. 
they basically all were in favor of road safety. <laughs> and it went on for an hour. And I thought at the end of that, what have I joined? A madhouse. They've just spent tenths of the budget on something you don't even know what they bought. And they've spent an hour talking about something that we're going to have anyway. But then 60 years, when you think of it, the computers have taken over our lives. And they are capable, they're indispensable. But all, like all such advances of science, they're capable of being used for good and for evil. When one sees the effects of social media, that's the downside of computers. So let us give thanks for such technological achievements, which have made tremendous changes to our lives in so many ways. But let us also pray that such devices are used for our benefit and not in for our detriment. Lord, in our mercy, hear our prayer. I recently read a book, Fact and Fact and Factfulness, by a Swede called Hans Rosling. He set up focus groups in 35 countries and asked them 13 questions, such as, do you think people are getting richer or poorer? Do you think the world population is growing or not? And if it's growing by how much? Is climate change taking place? He then assembled all available data to compare this with the views of the focus groups. In every case, the focus groups will weigh out to a lesser or greater degree, and invariably they were more negative and, pes and pessimistic than the detailed surveys and uh, analysis wanted. There is still desperate poverty in the world, but it's not actually so desperate as it was 20 years ago. So, we, um, Lord, we have faith in Jesus Christ. We have belief in a better afterlife. But let us all remain positive in our actions in this life. Let us not become doomsayers, always thinking we have no future. Let us give thanks for living when we do. Lord, in our mercy, hear our prayer. A few days ago, many, like many of you, I'm sure, I watched the Queen opening Parliament with no Prince Philip to accompany her. I met Prince Philip on three occasions. In May 1982, the Queen, accompanied by Prince Philip, came to open Shinfield Park, which is the County Council's new headquarters. We were all lined up to meet either the Queen or Prince Philip in two lines. I was in Prince Philip's line and he was in sparkling form, joking and joking away, chatting to everyone. But we could see the Queen in the other line looked like thunder. She did not want to be there. We wondered what on earth had gone wrong. There must have been some real big row. Anyway, after they'd gone, somebody turned around, have you heard the news? We just decided to invade the Falklands. So she had other things on her mind, but Prince Philip, no, totally, totally unfazed. The second time was when my Christina was high sheriff. We decided to hold a charity, Beat the Balance Walk, and we thought we could have a royal patron, and we found that Prince Philip was available for hire. <laughs> um, it, the deal was his charity got 10% of the take, and that's true. So we actually raised the end 6,000 pounds, and the Duke of Edinburgh's Walk got 600. But he was very good. He came along to the opening. We, we decided, because we hadn't been served we better start in the front of Windsor Castle. So we started the walk there. It was a lovely sunny day. Prince Philip came chatting to everyone. There was one young lad there, had his headphones on. And Prince Philip sort of said, if you don't take those bloody things off, how the hell do you think you're going to hear me? <laughs> Very typical. And the third time was, um, was the, uh, the mayor, the mayor of Royal Borough's charity hall. And Prince Philip had been invited, but it declined. The last minute he decided there was nothing useful on television, on TCC on television, he just turned up. Just turned up, that caused absolute chaos. <laughs> but that was him, that was him, that's the three sides of him. <laughs> he could be difficult, but he was also a wonderful rock to our queen. And uh, there's no doubt that she will miss him like anything. But she carries out her duties nevertheless. And so we're so fortunate to have her as a queen at such unstable times. 
So Lord, in your mercy, give thanks to our Queen and all the royal family. And let us pray, pray also for the rifts in the family that have now appeared are quick are quickly healed. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Our greatest constitutional crisis now is the wish of many in Scotland to achieve independence. I have German friends who toured Scotland just before the pandemic, and they told me everywhere they went, <coughs> Scots complained to them that Scotland was having to pay for England. Now, down in England, we're told that we're having to pay for Scotland. So, let us all pray, before any decision is taken on a referendum, there's an attempt to establish what the facts are as regards a break up the union, so that an informed decision can be taken. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us also thank and pray for Grant and the ministry team of Katie, Rosemary, Jonathan, Mike, and our church warden, Joe. Let us also pray for and support those of our faith who are still persecuted for their beliefs. Lord, help us to live together in forgiveness and let us proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. May God in his mercy lead us through these very difficult times, but above all, may he lead us to himself. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Clive, for those very relevant prayers. I found the one about the focus groups very interesting because apparently Britain was from the 10th to the 17th of the most content nations, and the most content nations the Scandinavian ones. All you have to do is look at the Scandinavian media and how they build up their government, their country, and look at how our media will play down our government and our country. You know, um, so that has an effect on people makes them more pessimistic than reality. Anyways, it's not Rosemary, it's Alison who's going to come and read us our gospel. Thank you, Alison. The gospel reading is taken from John chapter 17, reading verses 6 to 19. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. This is the word of the Lord. On uh, Thursday, I had the sort of biannual meeting with Bishop Olivia and the leaders of the different denominations in Berkshire. She does this twice a year. And we get together and we always discuss one passage of scripture before we, uh, before we deal with business and we will share thoughts about how different denominations have been coping at this present time. So Bishop Olivia says, oh, on Sunday, she said, I have to preach on John 17, 6 to 19. 
Have you got any thoughts on it? She said. <laughs> so, so, so there you are. She, she uh, used our thoughts for her sermon. I am really looking forward to what God has to say. So what I should have done is ask Bishop Olivier to send me her thoughts yeah. <laughs> and what you would have got is everybody else's thoughts. I'll note that one for next time. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you for your words and uh, we thank you that um, uh, it, within it contains everything necessary for, for our salvation and for our trust and belief and faith in you. Lord, help the uh, words of my mouth, Lord, and the meditations of my heart be glory and praise unto you, Lord, today. Amen. In um, October 2019, is that the one before the pandemic? I get a bit confused now. 2019, I think so. October 2019, I went to the doctors with a sore throat. <clears throat> and I had, according to him, the worst case of tonsillitis he had seen in about five years. And it was quite painful and rubbish at going to the doctors. I'm a typical bloke, I suppose, in one sense. Always put it off, never go, and it's always too late. Anyway, he told me about the antibiotics I needed and the course of painkillers I should take to make sure I'm not in too much pain. And uh, he also said, I want to see you in two weeks' time because this is quite bad. I want to make sure you've taken your, your tablets. And so I followed my course of treatment for the two weeks and the pain went and I could once again eat again and drink again and um, I was, uh, I was you know, feeling great. Anyway, I went back to my follow-up appointments, quite a happy chat. I thought, mm, for the first time I think in my life I've finished a course of antibiotics, I've not just left one or two in the packet and, you know, uh, I've forgotten about them, I've actually done it, I'm feeling better. And so I went in a happy chat. Anyway, he was seen quite pleased, you know, have you finished your tablets? Yes, Mr. Doctor. And uh, he said, okay, well, I'll just have a quick check. So I opened up my mouth and he said, ah, yes, I can see that your right tonsil was so damaged by that infection, it is still swollen. And I thought, oh, I can't feel anything. You know, it must just be, you know, we'll go down eventually. And he said, oh, well, yeah, might do. And then as he kind of reclined back into his chair, as they do, that kind of you know, doctor reclined, he said, of course, this may be something much more serious like throat cancer. And then there was that silence. And you know, I just had no words. Let's get you booked in to see a specialist. And everything up until that moment had been rosy. I was fine. And everything after that moment was not. It was somehow different. It was as if I was living in a slow motion film for a while. It literally hit me like a ton of bricks. Never in a million years I thought that this tonsillitis would be something so serious. And it was as if there was this dividing line in my life that everything up until that point was fine. And now I was entering into a new phase of uncertainty. Now, I'm not the only one to have had some kind of scare or worry or even to have had to deal with something like that. I think we all, to one degree or another, have these dividing lines in our life. And I think what I've come to realize is that a dividing line, if that's what I'm going to call them today, is actually not necessarily a particular time and a particular place, but actually it's a threshold moment that calls into question everything. You really question your priorities, your values, the way that we live and relate to one another, the things that truly matter, how we want to invest our time and our energy and even our money, how we want to be in this world, what we want from life. Dividing moments are those moments in our life where things suddenly get really rather real. <laughs> They hold, before, they hold before us questions about who we are, who we want to be, what we've done, whether our life matters, what we want from life and whether it makes a difference. Now perhaps, because I've certainly found myself being much more appreciative over the last 18 months, perhaps 
The whole human race has experienced something of this in this pandemic. Many of us feel like coronavirus is another defining line, dividing line in our lives. Now, I'm very blessed to be able to say, uh, despite my croaky voice this morning, that after many more tests and a double tonsillectomy and prodding, prodding and poking in areas that didn't seem relevant to my tonsils, um, I didn't have uh, any kind of throat cancer, but merely what they called a broken tonsil, <laughs> which it sounds much less impressive, I suppose, isn't it? Uh, just that it wouldn't shrink down to its original size. But in those weeks when I got that news, when I was wrestling with it, I couldn't sleep properly, couldn't eat properly, couldn't concentrate very much. It affected my thoughts, my prayers, my entire life. Maybe it would say I was useless around the house. You know, I was just not focusing on anything but what would happen if. And I kept asking the Lord questions. And I just kept telling him everything that was going on in my life because I just didn't know how else to process it. And despite me already knowing that he already knows everything that's going on in my life, I just kept waffling. And I think these moments really shake us, don't they? They become worrying. We, we, become, we become worried. They really shake our core being. And our lives in that moment become this ongoing process of just trying to get clarity about what's going on, just trying to restore our hope of some kind. And I wonder if that's what's happening with Jesus here in our gospel passage for today. Because here he is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before his arrest, before his trial, before his execution, knowing all that is to come. I think there's a big dividing line ahead of him. I don't know if you noticed, his prayer is not, dear God, please would you help me with my shopping? Please would you help my family? Please would you do this? Amen. It's not as simple as that. It's rambling and meandering, if you like. It's confusing. It's hard to understand. It moves back and forth, folds in on itself. It's almost as if, almost as if, Jesus wasn't told by the vicar that he was on intercessions that week. And he didn't quite know what to say. He had to do it off the cuff. These are not lovely, well-organized prayers by Jesus. It's as much about him as it is the disciples. And yet through all of that discussion, all that beautiful reading that Alison read for us, he only really asked for three things. That God would protect the disciples so that they may be as one as the Father and Jesus on, that God would protect them from the evil one, and that God would sanctify them in the truth. These are all lovely things, perfectly wonderful things to pray for, and yet he, he just continues waffling, really, in a huge sense of, of discourse. The rest of the prayer is Jesus saying what God has done, what he has done, what the disciples have done, what the world has done. I think the rest of the prayer is Jesus working through that dividing line, that, that, that pain that he's, he's approaching, working through what is happening. And this is my first point, really, that what amazes me about this passage is that in this prayer, I think I see the human Jesus standing in solidarity with us and our experience of life. It seems a little strange that Jesus would talk and pray like this, but then have a think about some of the conversations you've had. Have you ever had a conversation that goes round and round and round, talks about the same thing about 25 different times from different angles? We do it, don't we, naturally. We just have those conversations, and actually someone often walks away from that conversation going, oh, Grant's talking about the same thing again. But I've walked away from the conversation going, oh, I've really helped me process what I was thinking about. Sometimes it makes no sense. Often we contradict ourselves. It's anything but linear and straightforward. But it's useful. It's helpful. We're just trying to get some clarity and can come to terms with what's happening in our lives. And the only way that some of us know how to do that is to chat. So if your prayers are like this, if your prayers are a little bit of a waffle sometimes, great! Jesus did it too. Keep going, keep praying. Don't have to formulate your prayers into, 
into a formula, keep praying and let Jesus help you figure things out. He stands in solidarity with our experience. And yet, in the middle of this prayer, and this is where I kind of want to focus on really, in the middle of this unscripted, from the heart, off the cuff prayer, Jesus says this. He says, I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. This is my main take home point today. Jesus wants us, all of us, to experience his most blessed, holy, pure, unrestricted, without face covering, my, uh, joy in our hearts and our lives, even, even when things aren't and don't go right. Now, if our lives were purely about our personal advantage, I think Jesus might have prayed something slightly different. He would say, Father, get them out of here. Take them to heaven already, because this world is too painful to live in. Yeah, they are going to get bumped and bruised and scra- you know, scraped. There are going to be pains and troubles in this life. So, Lord, come on, whisk them away. But he doesn't. Instead of asking his Father to whisk us all out of here, Jesus prays, actually, that he would leave us here, right in the midst of a world in which we will be bruised, right in the midst of a world in which stuff, pain, happens. But that in doing so, in loving and in serving, in growing to know him, we would find his joy. And joy is different to happiness. Happiness is a feeling, you know, when Leicester City win the FA Cup, as they did yesterday, some of us would have been happy. But joy is an inexpressible feeling, deep, true joy. The joy of the Lord is this gladness of the heart that comes from knowing God, abiding in Christ, and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, when Jesus was born, the angels announced good tidings of great joy. All those who find Jesus know, along with those shepherds of nativity, the joy that he brings. Even before his birth, Jesus had brought joy, which we find in Mary's song, don't we? And by John, uh, John's response to hearing Mary's voice in the womb, he lets forth joy. I don't think Jesus exemplified joy in his ministry. He was no uh, glum person turning water into wine. is a pretty good trick to have. And I think that his enemies accused him of being too joyful on occasions. He describes himself as a bridegroom enjoying a wedding feast. He says, rejoice in the Holy Spirit. He speaks often of my joy. And here he promises to give his disciples a lifetime of supply of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Back in the Old Testament, Nehemiah told the repentant Israelites that the joy of the Lord would be their strength. And I think as we read the gospel, as we read the Acts of the Apostles, we find that the early church was characterized by this gladness and the joy of the Lord, which was their strength despite their persecutions. Joy in the Holy Spirit is a distinguishing mark of the kingdom of God. And so I think those who share in uh, parts of the kingdom also share in the kingdom's delight. We learn from 1 Peter, don't we? In Christ, a believer is filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Why is that? Why is it different to happiness? Because it's supernatural. It's not from us, it's from him. It's from God, the joy of the Lord. Our gladness of heart is present even through the trials of life or our dividing lines, if you like. We know that we are children of God and, you know, I think that nobody can snatch us away from him. Nobody can snatch us away from him. We're heirs to an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil and never fade. No one can steal it from us. Now, I'm not sure there's much joy in the world at the moment. It certainly doesn't feel like if you read any newspaper or any uh, news outlet of any kind. 
And I think where we step into this is our faith, because our faith is a victory, if you like, that overcomes the world, not fighting in Israel and Palestine, not fear uh, in our politics. The joy of the Lord is the strength that will renew us and sustain us in adverse circumstances, or even in those horrible moments of life. Joy can actually be enhanced. We just think about Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail cell. Their persecution. They were singing hymns. They were singing hymns in jail. The joy of the Lord was their strength. Now the joy of the Lord may be inexplicable to the one that does not possess it, but for the believer in Christ, the joy of the Lord comes as naturally as grapes on the vine. As we abide in Christ, as we and abide in this true vine, we, his branches, become full of his strength and vitality. And the fruit that we produce, including joy, is his doing. I think you can always tell Christians out from a crowd, normally. Sometimes people say, oh, Christians all walk around like this. You know, it's just, you know, sad. I don't think they do. I think Christians walk around with the biggest smiles on their faces, knowing that it's complete, it's done in Christ. He has made a way for us. And I don't know about you, but after this last year, I could certainly do with a lot more joy in my life. You know, because sometimes we've been focusing too much on the negatives. So my encouragement is simply this today, that we're going to ask the Lord together to increase our joy, to give us opportunities to be joyful. Now this comes with a warning, because uh, perhaps he might answer this prayer, we don't know. And if he does, great, you will find yourself singing in the shower. You will find yourself dancing as you're chopping potatoes for your Sunday dinner. Perhaps you'll whistle when you're on the bus, if we're allowed to, we're allowed to whistle, who knows, that's not quite singing, is it? <coughs> but perhaps you'll find a way to bless somebody this week, maybe practically, spiritually, maybe you'll just ring someone up and say, I really want to encourage you, how can I pray for you? Because let us be those joyful people in a world lacking happiness, lacking joy, that we would profess our faith in words of joy, in deeds of joy, professing the hope to which we have found in Christ. So shall we pray and ask the Lord to increase our joy today. Lord, we thank you so much for your joy, which can be found in Christ. But not, not only do we um, have our own joy, but Jesus, you want to put your joy within us. And so today we open our hearts to you. And whatever is going on in our lives, however sad, however difficult, however isolated we may feel, may you come and flood us this morning with your spirit and fill us up with the full measure of your joy, that we would leave this place in joyful anticipation of waking one day in your presence, Lord. That you would give us joy to spread on this earth in times of darkness, pointing to the hope which we have. Lord, make us joy carriers, joy bringers, joy givers in your most mighty and most holy name we pray. Amen. Just before Mike introduces the last hymn, I just wanted to explain about the singing in, in case any of you weren't here when I first mentioned it. From, from the middle of April, we were allowed to have a small choir. Um, so the small choir is the people that sit in the front row, and they, they are actually the people that I invited on that first Sunday. We were allowed to sing, have our small choir. But it's only the people sitting in the front because it's the aerosol that um, spreads the... Um, virus. So if you're sitting in the front, there's nobody in front of you. So that's, again, it's not for communion services either. But um, uh, if you want to join the small choir and sit in the front row, then let me know. And we've, uh, we, we haven't got six. So, um, but, but I didn't want you to think we were breaking the rules. And I know um, I explained it the first Sunday, and then the next Sunday I didn't explain it. And a couple of people said to me afterwards, why are people singing? And it does give us great joy to sing, doesn't it? And it really lifts our spirits, even if it's 
um, just the furious in the front. So, um, but if you do want to sing and join the small choir, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Um, you're right, happiness comes from the word happen chance. In other words, it's chance that you're happy. Events decide whether you're happy or not. Events decide whether you're sad or not. But to have the inner joy and the inner peace of Christ is not dependent on circumstances. It depends upon Him and our relationship with Him. So, we're going to have a Christmas carol. <laughs> right, because I love Christmas carols, and why do we keep them just to Christmas? So this last one is Joy to the World, the Lord is Come. So you in the front row, sing your hearts out, please. <laughs> Let us pray. My God, our Father, thank you for all good gifts that come from you. We thank you especially for the gift of your Son and accept these gifts now, we pray, and use them for your work in this, in this village and in this church. In Christ's name. Amen. Okay, if you'd like to share the blessing with me, I'll read the bits in regular time. If you'd like to respond to the bits in italics, please. So may the Lord bless us. And may the Lord bless us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us. So let us depart in peace to serve the Lord and one another in love. Let us offer one another the sign of peace. However you want to do it, there we are. Thank you. Peace be with you. God bless us all. Thank you.